This episode of News Dump is brought to you by Masterclass. There's a lot to get to on today's episode, from dumb stuff like DC films falling apart to important stuff like legislation that has a very real effect on people's lives. Yeah, it does make us feel a bit insane to cover such a wide variety of stuff, but we also enjoy being your one-stop shop for information overload. It's our curse. Uh, so let's start on a lighter note with uh, the more standard entertainment news stuff. Side note, we are aware that the Game Awards are happening, uh, literally while we're filming this. Oh. So yeah, I'm just going to record a quick update from home because I don't have time to watch three hours of ads and ten minutes of awards. I, I, mean, know, I know they have to pay their bills, but I just can't do it. Yeah, the only reason to tune into the Game Awards is to see the trailers. Yes. The, the awards themselves can fit on a uh, note card, essentially. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, if you Nothing care, wrong with watching it for the trailers and debuts. If you care about the winners, uh, you Google.com. And then just like the Oscars, just like winners list, please. If you care about the trailers, YouTube.com. Oh, look, you're already there. So yeah, that's very easy. easy. Um, but yes, I will. I'll, I'll chime in at the end of the episode to just uh, fire off some winners or some big announcements that are worth talking about. But let's start out with the drama that is unfolding over at Warner Brothers regarding DC Films. I love this so much. Yeah. Uh, Snyder Nation in shambles. They are. Uh, yeah, it's it's. Coming to an end for them, and they are not happy the about Snyder it. The Snyder cult, they're like those Japanese soldiers off in like the, uh, the Philipp uninhabited Filipino islands in like 1960. The war's over? No. no. I, unless not until Zack Snyder himself. Zack Snyder himself has to come here and tell me to my face that it's over. Or else I'm going to stay out here and keep on fighting. But anyway, back to DC and, uh, and the chaos that is once again unfolding. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you can you believe another Warner company seems to just be a total fucking mess with uh, it's so no long-term plan whatsoever? Yeah, almost It's weird if, how uh, that keeps happening. Every decision is reactionary based on what just happened in the market. Warner Brothers, mm. a real entertainment company. Yeah. So if you had asked us to describe DC films over the past few years from the outside looking in, which is exactly the perspective that we have, yeah. uh, chaotic would fit pretty well. In just the last two years alone, there have been countless executive staffing changes, a lukewarm critical reception to nearly every release, uh, some films that straight up flop, indecisiveness at every turn, and an entire franchise that rests on the shoulders of an actor who has been committing various crimes across the entire planet for the better part of half a decade. Also, a movie that they just shelved uh, after shooting the whole goddamn thing. Well, Elliot, um, if you've been following the news, they've actually moved the movie up a couple days because that's how confident they are in its success. They're like, we need to get this out far sooner than we had ever hoped. I was uh, talking about Batgirl, but... Uh, oh, oh, I'm talking about The Flash. No, that's definitely still happening. That's definitely coming out. That, it has to happen. Mm -hmm. It has to happen. Yes. Uh, and also Batman, The Batman, which was great. Yeah, there are some uh, great standouts a there. A great movie that had no continuity whatsoever with uh, any... Extended Universe uh, was just the work of a director with an idea and the skills to realize that idea. Mm -hmm. um, interesting that that's the one DC project to actually uh, succeed critically and commercially well, uh, in the ways that they would like. Joker, Birds of Prey. Joker's another one. Uh, yeah. No connection whatsoever also, to any don't, universe. Also, doesn't really need to have any follow-up. Uh, kind of funny that they're doing a musical with Lady Gaga, if that's accurate. But, you know, didn't, didn't really need a sequel. They need to replace the Joker with Desmond. Yes, they do. So and this is all in addition to the drastic cost-cutting measures that have been taking place very publicly ever since the Warner Brothers Discovery merger slash Warner Brothers AT&T <laughs> divorce was yeah. all finalized. So no, actually, it's not surprising at all that DC Films is going through adjustments. And uh, we're really hoping that they're finally going to make the right decisions for once. Yeah. Please. Um, but yeah, basically, a story dropped earlier in the week announcing that, shocker, there's not going to be a Wonder Woman 3. Oh no, I was such a big fan of Wonder Woman 2, which, yeah. which I never saw, but... Uh... I have, and uh, I'm sure that some of you have, and <laughs> yeah, they are putting this franchise out of its misery and protecting the legacy of the first film from future harm by doing this. Yeah, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, uh, so... Anyways, uh, with that story, there were like big nods to changes taking place internally at WB and DC. Not only was Warner, or sorry, Wonder Woman three being canceled, it was also reported that Henry Cavill and Jason Momoa probably wouldn't return in their superhero roles. <laughs> Didn't they tease a big return for yeah. Cavill in, in Aquaman two or whatever the hell it was? Uh, we'll get. Yes, it was Black Adam. I That's, know that you're confused, but okay. Um, and this is it goes without saying that they. Theoretically, I don't know, but I think because of the Flash movie, 
some stuff has obviously already been filmed with them, and they will appear on screen. The Flash movie is just going to end with a, a hastily hand-drawn title card that says uh, the DC Cinematic Universe was destroyed on the way to its home planet. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, the, the any further production with them is in question, and this is in spite of Henry Cavill, like two weeks ago, going, "I'm back, baby." Yeah, I mean, he so, quit The Witcher. Yeah. So, damn. But, this obviously doesn't make it seem as though DC has a lot of hope for the box office success of Aquaman 2, which is coming out very soon because yeah. the news that it's like, and by the way, we're done. Uh, we're done here. And the movie hasn't even come out yet. It's, I mean, look, if you're going to put two movies that look exactly the same to me, Avatar 2 and Aquaman 2, I'm going to see Avatar, especially based on the initial reactions that I've seen, which it's more wet. Yeah. And prettier. Uh, yeah, I yeah. still haven't even seen Avatar 1. I shouldn't even be What is wrong with you? I'm, you know, at this point, it's like I, I could see Avatar, but I, I, you know, what's the point? So I'm not going to see Avatar 2 because obviously I haven't seen Avatar 1. And it, I haven't seen Avatar 1 after 10 years of it being like the biggest movie of all time. Like, what's the fucking point? I, I'm just going to sit this out. Much like with Stadia, you you get to complain freely about everything. And I have to live through the the sacrifice of experiencing it. Yeah. Also, the new Avatar is like three and a half hours long. Mm -mm. And James Cameron, he's like, it's fine to get up and pee. Just catch the parts you miss on your second viewing. I'm like, fuck that, James Cameron. You're uh, a genius. I love you, but uh, no. Sorry. You're going to need to double up on the edible for the three and a half hour long Avatar, which people are re recommending. Also, it's in 48 in frames per second, which, sorry, that's where I get off. Apparently, it's the first uh, like decent use of that. Nope. Nope. Looks like a British soap opera. <laughs> sorry. I'll be seeing it in theaters in the, bi the biggest screen possible. I'll see it on the smallest screen possible. On and, the toilet, on the, yeah. on your phone. Uh, here's some info from the original article in Hollywood Reporter that started all this DC talk. Mm -hmm. A cleaning of the slate is common when a new executive team is put in place to run a studio or division, but there is likely little precedent for the amount of Clorox James Gunn and Peter Safran could spray as they prepare to launch DC Studios and guide superhero movies for the next half decade and beyond. Multiple sources tell The Hollywood Reporter that Patty Jenkins' Wonder Woman 3 is not moving forward and is considered dead in its current incarnation. Sources say that Jenkins recently submitted her treatment, co-written with Jeff Johns, and that Gunn and Safran, as well as Warner Brothers Pictures co-chairs and co-CEOs Michael DeLuca and Pamela Abdi, broke the news to the filmmaker, telling her the project, as it stood, did not fit in with the new but still unfolding plans. We don't know what the plan is, but you're not involved. Patty, you're no longer hot. Mm -hmm. Get out of here. So the article continues saying, the rest of the DC slate remains in flux, or at least is being kept deep in a pocket of Gunn's own utility belt, but there are several rumors and possible scenarios to consider ahead of next week's meeting. The first, which builds on the shuttering of Jenkins' One Roman 3, is the closing curtain of the Snyderverse, and the heroes cast by filmmaker Zack Snyder for his Justice League. This one sees the shutting down of Man of Steel 2 with a returning Henry Cavill, and having no more Aquaman, fronted by Jason Momoa. These characters are to cameo in Flash, the highly anticipated time travel adventure movie that is due to release June 16th. Cavill shot his part of the cameo in September, but sources say there is a debate inside the studio as to whether or not to keep the cameo, <laughs> and if its inclusion promises something that the studio would have no plans on delivering. Oh, man. Wouldn't that be insane? Because, because, because now that they've said this, and if anything is cut from this Flash movie, this Flash movie needs to be eight hours long. Yeah. Because if anything is cut, you will not hear the end of it oh, yeah, for the is. next couple of years about how there is a Who's a even genius, directing this? I have no idea. Release the whatever that guy's name is cut. I, it has changed directors a couple times. Uh, release, um, <laughs> release the Miller cut. Well, that's the thing is once, uh, once all of this comes out and everyone says, regardless of how the Flash movie is, says that there's a better movie in there somewhere, Zack Snyder will then get his chance to do it, um, yeah. as is Warner Brothers tradition. Uh, you know what? I think they should really change it up. They should let Elon Musk run DC films. Wow. I think you're really onto something there. Because, uh, I mean, it would probably be run exactly as it is right now. It's like introducing the blue check mark. Whoops, never mind. Yeah. Bringing Henry Cavill back. Whoops, never mind. Exactly. I mean, but their powers combined, 
And it's, it's also it, like exactly the way it's playing out with Twitter now is like Elon Musk is like, no, why would you ever edit a movie? Everything that people shoot should be shown to the audience, like clearly. And then he watches like an eight hour cut of something and goes, oh God, yeah. oh God, this needs to be cut down to something presentable. Elon Musk has invented film editing. Yes. So anyway, this is all pretty weird because yeah, Henry Cavill was just celebrating his return to the character very publicly upon the release of Black Adam, a film that despite The Rock claiming otherwise, isn't the runaway success that they had hoped for. He is like on Twitter every other day being like, no, actually the film's doing awesome. And everything's great. I mean, I'm sure it is for The Rock. Like, Yeah, well, I mean, it's The Rock. He's going to promote his own stuff, yeah. I get it. But like the idea that Black Adam is some like monster hit is false. Um, but in response to the article, James Gunn posted directly to Twitter. So as for the story yesterday in The Hollywood Reporter, some of it is true, some of it is half true, some of it is not true, and some of it we haven't decided yet whether is true or not. Although this first month at DC has been fruitful, building the next 10 years of story takes time, and we're still just beginning. Peter and I chose to helm DC Studios knowing we were coming into a fractious environment, both in the stories being told and in the audience itself, and there would be an unavoidable transitional period as we moved into telling a cohesive story across film, TV, animation, and gaming. But in the end, the drawbacks of that transitional period were dwarfed by the creative possibilities and the opportunity to build upon what has worked in DC so far and to help rectify what has not. We know we are not going to make every single person happy every step of the way, but we can promise everything we do is done in the service of the story and in the service of the DC characters we know you cherish and we have cherished our whole lives. And while this is almost certainly the right move, it's going to be a massive uphill battle, not only because of the middling results from DC over the past few years, but also because of the ever-increasing superhero movie fatigue that seems to be hitting even the most anticipated franchises. Yeah, Marvel is even suffering from it. Uh, it's chugging along, but it's uh, it's an uphill ride now. It's, it was a blessing and a curse to have the Avengers franchise. Like, that, that you can't really top Endgame when you're talking about, like, a... They can, and they will, down the line, but it kind of is an endpoint for an entire generation. It is, uh, it was very ambitious uh, to say we're going to treat an entire film series as if it's a TV show, where you get, like, four episodes a year. And, uh, yeah, and then there's a huge conclusion. And just going on forever. And they have to restart and hope uh, that people are still going to watch, which they will, but it's going to take a while to get that momentum. Point, basically, once... Once they, once Marvel introduced the the TV shows, is when I like yeah. unconsciously made the decision. I'm just like, it's too much. I can't, I can't keep up with all this uh, shit. Sorry, I'm done. This is where I get off. Side note, complete side tangent. Uh, Andor is fantastic. Yeah, I just I started it uh, two weeks ago, and it is the best Star Wars. I haven't even seen years. Rise of Skywalker. What That's do you another, do? With, what do you do with your? Time? That's another one. Star Wars. Like uh, everyone was talking about how great Boba Fett was. I watched the first two episodes. I'm like, this is boring as fuck. I'm I done. I'm getting like, off this. Didn't like Boba Fett. Or not Boba Fett, uh, The Mandalorian, whatever. I, lo I like Mandalorian, but yeah, uh, and Andor's completely different. It's it's awesome. I like it a lot. Anyways, <laughs> uh, back to all of this. Um, this. This is all without saying that they have to craft these films for an entirely different generation. Yeah. One that they need to sell their vision on because they are the ones who are going to be committing to following along for the next decade. This is not about millennials and it's uh, it's more focused on Gen Z and below because they're not trying to please you. You're going to be too old soon. They're wow. trying to please people who are going to enjoy it for a decade. Would, uh, would an old man have 200 Funko Pops in his office? They're hoping for Check the next eight. old man that's going to have 200 <laughs> Funko Pops. Would a man who's 40, year olds at, 40 years old at, at heart have a life-size Batman suit in his office? That's, that's the thing, is they've already gotten all the money out of those people, and they're ready for the next generation of people who want that Funko wall. What's the company that makes the super expensive uh, collectibles? Uh, Sideshow. Yeah, Sideshow yeah. Collectibles. Would an old man have spending half of his paycheck on Sideshow Collectibles every month? I don't think so. Hey, look, it's uh, it's up to you now, Gen Z. But yeah, we do want to point out that there is a narrative forming around uh, James Gunn online that uh, he's actually a secret <laughs> agent and that Disney is paying him to destroy DC from the inside. I oh. love this conspiracy theory. Okay, it has nothing to do with uh, that little blip uh, where uh, he got canceled over some jokes and, got, and lost his job and went to DC... Uh, 
to potentially employ him, thus creating a business related. No, it has nothing to do with that. This was all the long, the con, long con, going yeah. back like six years. So yeah, that's the kind of level-headed thinking that you'll run into online in this discourse. So just don't run into it. Avoid it. But enough about DC, because we have to move over to the acquisition of Activision Blizzard. Gamer news. Yeah, gamer news. Um, so everyone kind of, you know, in general, it's easy to forget that this kind of uh, acquisition was happening after Big it was ones. announced. Big mergers. Uh, but you know who didn't forget? The Federal Trade Commission. They have now filed a lawsuit aimed at blocking the deal. Here's The Verge with more. The FTC has filed a legal challenge to try and block Microsoft's plan to buy Activision Blizzard for $68.7 billion, according to a press release from the regulator. The FTC argues that the acquisition would enable Microsoft to suppress competitors to its Xbox gaming consoles and its rapidly growing subscription content and cloud gaming business. Microsoft has already shown that it can and will withhold content from its gaming rivals, Holly Vidova, director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition, said in a statement. Today we seek to stop Microsoft from gaining control over a leading independent game studio and using it to harm competition in multiple dynamic and fast-growing gaming markets. Uh, so, I mean, this quote is kind of silly, considering Sony has been doing Call of Duty console exclusives for quite some time now, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, They've got the spirit. They, they do have the spirit. We, we just wish that these governing bodies would have been more proactive sooner because these types of massive acquisitions, they've been taking place across all industries for a while now. Yeah. It seems kind of weird that it took a big gaming merger to perk everyone's ears up, but I hope this sets some precedent. There are multiple mergers that have happened over the last few years that honestly should not have happened. And have clearly resulted in, uh, had negative side effects. There is a big monopoly problem in this, in this country. Uh, yeah. And then the gamers popped up and they were like, no. But hey, look, they find inspiration in weird places. Uh, gamers uh, breaking up monopolies, potentially. Uh, Taylor Swift fans breaking up monopolies, potentially. Never thought I'd find myself fighting alongside a Swifty. <laughs> what about a friend? <laughs> Uh, yes, but speaking of longstanding institutions actually facing potential repercussions for taking the whole greed thing a little too far, Ticketmaster and Live Nation are now facing lawsuits and potential government regulation because they finally pissed off a group of people that are more powerful than any government on earth. Taylor Swift fans. We said when all this was getting started that if any fan base had the power to actually change the way Ticketmaster operates, it would be Taylor Swift fans. And nothing could piss them off worse than being financially exploited for simply wanting to see their favorite musician live in a stadium that could certainly fit anyone who actually wants to watch the singer perform across multiple nights. And we don't want to go over the entire story again, and you've probably already lived through the experience, though maybe not through Taylor Swift tickets, but it was a perfect example of how bad things have gotten with Ticketmaster's self-dealing and scalp protection efforts. My scalp. Uh, t tickets for Taylor Swift concerts went on sale and seemingly no legitimate person was able to get decent tickets at face value, with the cost of instantly available resale tickets going for thousands of dollars. Mm, tale as old as time. Mm -hmm. It's outrageous, but yeah, it's something that people have been screaming about for years. Luckily though, the Swifties are organized, powerful, and intimidating. Maybe not individually, but as a group, mm -hmm. don't want to get in their way. And the mess that Ticketmaster has caused might not be so easy to ignore this time around, because aside from drawing additional unwanted attention from regulators, they're now being sued by Taylor Swift's fans. Here's NPR with more on this. More than two dozen disappointed Swifties have filed a class action lawsuit accusing Ticketmaster and its parent company, Live Nation, of fraud misrepresentation, and antitrust violations over its botched ERA's tour ticket sale. Lawyers for the 26 plaintiffs who live in 13 states across the U.S. filed the complaint in L.A. County Superior Court on Friday. It alleges that the ticketing platform has a monopoly on primary and secondary markets and accuses it of engaging in fraudulent practices and various antitrust violations, including price discrimination and price fixing. Defendant's anti-competitive behavior has substantially harmed and will continue to substantially harm Taylor Swift fans, as well as competition in the ticket sales market and the secondary ticket services market, it reads. It seeks $2,500 for every violation of California's unfair competition law, which prohibits false advertising and illegal business practices. And what's funny about all of this is that it, there's an admission here from the head of the FTC 
uh, that this one tour by a major recording artist has done more to turn a generation of people into anti-monopolists than anything that she could have done. So yeah, like we said, thank you, Taylor Swift, uh, comrade uh, Chairman Taylor. Your overwhelming popularity has uncovered numerous problems with previously untouchable companies and inspired a generation of people to confidently tell these companies to fuck off. Mm -hmm. We just hope that actual change is possible because there was a massive class action a few years ago against Ticketmaster and they just sort of gave everyone tickets to shows that weren't selling well as a settlement, which was probably worked out for them in the end. They probably made money off of that. Anyway, we have more to get to, obviously. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to be coming to you from my little home office with any important updates regarding the video game I awards. can't imagine anything important happening. I'm sure that God of War Ragnarok is going to win. The only thing I care Sonic's about... Sonic's going to win. I only care about the gaffes and the goofs. Yeah, is, is Hydrobot going to show up? Did someone say something that made Jeff Keighley visibly uncomfortable? Yes. But yeah, let's take a quick Fuck second. Konami. <laughs> <laughs> let's take a second to thank today's sponsor before we get in the rest of the show. Folks, it is Masterclass, your window into the minds of the most influential and talented people living today for your benefit. Including a few gamers. Yeah. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn about filmmaking with Werner Herzog, Martin Scorsese, Spike Lee, Ken Burns, and James Cameron. You can improve your cooking skills with Gordon Ramsay, Wolfgang Puck, and Roy Choi. And you can learn from some of the greatest minds in music, like Tom Morello, Herbie Hancock, Hans Zimmer, Danny Elfman, and Dead Mouse. With over 180 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. And we've said it many times before, but you'll get into Masterclass once you have uh, unlimited access into something that you're really, really interested in, and then your mind will wander basically yeah, click, seeing what who's available. There's like a million classes. Yeah. No, you know, terms apply. There's not a million, but there's yeah. a lot. And uh, you scroll through it, and it's like, oh, hey, let me put on like 10 minutes of this guy. Yeah. Then there's that guy. It's awesome. I like it. Um, but yeah, Masterclass is, of course, accessible on your phone, but it's also on the web and your smart TV, offering classes on a wide variety of topics, all taught by world-class instructors at the top of their field. Each class is broken out into individual video lessons, usually around 10 minutes long. Members can explore at their own pace, and each class is supported by downloadable materials, class guides, recipes, and more. These are cinema quality classes that give you unparalleled access to a renowned instructor. Lessons range from specifically showing you how to execute a technique to an instructor's insights about their craft that can be translated across many fields and disciplines. A new product that Masterclass is offering that's really intriguing is Sessions. Sessions offers a deeper dive over a month-long period and includes projects to submit to a teaching assistant for feedback, as well as the opportunity to learn alongside a community of peers. And this is available to subscribers at no extra cost. We highly recommend that you check out Masterclass. This holiday, give one annual membership and get one free. Go to masterclass.com slash newsdump. That is masterclass.com slash newsdump. Terms apply. All right, now back into the news for the second half of the show, and let's start things off with some good news. Although this is news that it, it just feels like it should be outdated because it's kind of insane that American citizens are still fighting for the right to marry whoever they want. Regardless... The House and the Senate have taken big steps forward on protecting same-sex and interracial marriage, and now it's going to head to the president's desk where he, he will sign this into law. And again, it is, it is infuriating that this is even being discussed in the year 2022. Thought we settled this eight years ago. But here's the Washington Post either way. The House on Thursday passed landmark legislation that would enshrine marriage equality in federal law, granting protections to same-sex and interracial couples and clearing the way for President Biden's signature. The House had already passed an earlier version of the Respect for Marriage Act in July, but the Senate delayed its vote on the bill until after the midterm elections. Late last month, the Senate passed the bill with a bipartisan amendment to allay some Republicans' concerns about religious liberty. The amended bill passed the Senate in a 61 to 36 vote, with 12 Republican senators joining Democrats in favor of it. So, I mean, yeah, it seems like they were waiting and hedging their bets on which way the election was going to go. Luckily, it was a huge loss for the more extreme members of the Republican Party, yeah. and it seems to have snapped people back to reality. Well, there goes gravity. Mom spaghetti. Yeah. But yeah, that wording there, it really makes it feel like same-sex and interracial marriage might have actually been in jeopardy if all the MAGA and Q and stolen election jabber, jabber, jabber people won their races. Yeah, kind of scary, honestly. And I mean, even the ones that lost, the margins were too well, close for comfort for me. Yeah. 
But uh, yeah, so this heads to Biden's desk now where he's you know, obviously already indicated that he'll sign it. But the most fascinating and pathetic moment from Congress had to be the reaction from Missouri GOP Congresswoman Vicki Hartzler, who broke down into tears while begging her fellow members of Congress to please vote against marriage equality, please. I hope and pray that my colleagues will find the courage to join me in opposing this misguided and this dangerous bill. And I yield back. Pathetic. Cry more, bitch. But another news that is sure to shock the boomers, goblin mode has gone mainstream. And it has therefore immortalized Twitter user Juniper for their contributions to our lexicon. That's so fucking crazy. Uh, it is, it is, it's dumb, but also hilarious. I mean, you heard that right. Goblin mode is, it's the biggest thing right now. And it's even bigger because it has been verified by Oxford, who says it is the word of the year. No, it fucking isn't. It's the word of the year. Wait, so Miriam Webster did gaslighting. Yeah. Oxford's supposed to be more legit. Yeah, so that this would, you know, oh, this lead is... me to believe that goblin mode is more legit. Well, how do they? How can you do goblin mode? How do you? You have to define your terms. Why well, do you define goblin mode? They it's did, not a well, real thing. They first of all they define it. Second of all, uh, it's funny you bring that up because we were both on the opinion that Merriam-Webster misdefined uh, goblin mode in their explanation of what gaslighting. it. Not, sorry, gaslighting in their yeah. explanation no, of they, what it meant. They totally fucking did. Yeah, which is. Nuts, but anyways, it's the end of the year, and these people are just as desperate as we are for con content, so we're going to let them have it, and we're going to talk to you about why Oxford decided to go with goblin mode, uh, much to the joy of everyone online and the dismay of uh, very stuffy people. Yeah. Here's their official post. The Oxford word of the year is a word or expression reflecting the ethos, mood, or preoccupations of the past 12 months, one that has potential as a term of lasting cultural significance. Supported by evidence of real language usage, Oxford's editors track candidates as they emerge throughout the year, analyzing frequency statistics and other language data in the Oxford English corpus. Previous words have included vax, 2021, climate emergency, 2019, and selfie, 2013. Yeah, those are all like real things that are talked about widely on a daily basis, like among, like across society. Goblin mode is not I don't care. That. I don't fucking care. This is bizarre. I love it. Love it. I mean, I love it too. It's just like there had to have been another term. Like metaverse, I feel like, would have been a more accurate uh, new word or whatever. Uh, no, I think as far as explaining the year, I think goblin mode does it pretty well. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it goblin does. mode has no definition. It's the year when everyone was like, even if COVID's still here, fuck it. I'm going to get naked and run across Panama City Beach while holding a giant flaming palm frond. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah, the year's this year's winner. This is this is, is this is their 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 uh, post. Okay. This year's winner is Goblin Mode. Goblin Mode, a slang term, often no, <laughs> no, just no. read. This is how they wrote it, Elliot. <laughs> often used in the expressions. In goblin mode, or to go goblin mode, is a type of behavior which is unapologetically self-indulgent, lazy, slovenly, or greedy, typically in a way that rejects social norms or expectations. Okay, sure. See? Although first seen on Twitter in 2009, goblin mode went viral on social media in February 2022, quickly making its way into newspapers and magazines after being tweeted in a mocked up headline. The term then rose in popularity over the months following as COVID lockdown restrictions eased in many countries and people ventured out of their homes more regularly. Seemingly, it captured the prevailing mood of individuals who rejected the idea of returning to normal life or rebelled against the increasingly unattainable aesthetic standards and unsustainable lifestyles exhibited on social media. That's an awesome analysis of this okay. completely nonsensical throwaway joke that Juniper put up one day on Twitter. I have never heard a person use the term goblin mode in real life without referencing the actual like tweet that it this came is, from. The, I think, you know, Oxford's doing a lot of the heavy lifting with what the phrase actually means. Um, I really think that Juniper just thought it was funny. Yeah, I don't think in 50 to 100 years... Well, you don't know. You're going to look back and like... Yes, 2020, 
2022, the year of goblin mode. You don't know that, though. I do know that. Okay. I do know that. The Oxford Corpus lists many vivid examples of goblin mode, including goblin mode is like when you wake up at 2 a.m. and shuffle into the kitchen wearing nothing but a long t-shirt to make a weird snack like melted cheese on saltines, as quoted in the Guardian newspaper. Oh, That's yeah, you're a goblin. Literally the lamest example wow, they could have. Wow, I'm such a goblin. I'm eating food after midnight. Yeah, well, you're it's a gremlin. Like gremlin mode. I'm yeah. gremlin mode. <laughs> yeah, that should be the new one. Yeah. Gremlin mode. Uh, more recently, an opinion piece in The Times stated that, quote, too many of us have gone goblin mode in response to it. Oh, really? <laughs> in what way? In what way have you gone goblin mode? I mean, I was I was eating uh, uh, candy cane JoJo's in bed last night. You're I was not feeling a, a little bit like a goblin. You're not a goblin. I was feeling a little bit like a goblin. No. No. I felt, I did feel bad. Those honestly. JoJo's this year, they're like crack. They are, they're each, really good. Each one's like 150 calories, too. It's like, yeah, because oh, no. You're yes. eating the literal chocolate-covered ones. Yeah. I'm eating the ones that are like Oreos, except oh, peppermint. I, yeah, I've got the ones that, yeah. They're, they're literally covered yeah. in a layer of chocolate. Oh, they're delicious. They are very good, but bad for you. Yeah. Uh, speaking at a special event to announce this year's approach to selecting the Oxford Word of the Year, Ben Zimmer, American linguist and lexicographer, said, Fuck you! <laughs> Goblin mode really does speak to the times and the zeitgeist, and it is certainly a 2022 expression. <laughs> people are looking at social norms in new ways. It gives people the license to ditch social norms and embrace new ones. Again, people are thinking way too much into this. It is so simple, but whatever. It is still wild to see that kind of thorough analysis on a phrase that was literally created as a joke on Twitter. It's like if they were like, and second place is the Snickers dick vein. Yeah. Uh, anyways, as proof of the, of the phrase going mainstream as a direct result of Oxford's feature, look no further than the cunning linguist himself, Stephen King, who tweeted the following after the announcement. I learned a new phrase today, going goblin. I intend to use it at every opportunity. He didn't even get it right. Yeah, he, well, he is a boomer. Yeah, he's old as shit. Yeah. In fact, he may have perfected it. Going goblin is maybe more uh, easy to use for people. Yeah. Oddly, Stephen King written dozens, hundreds of books. I don't believe he's ever written about goblins. It sounds like more of an R.L. Stein thing. Yeah. Goblins are like, the. it's like a kid's demon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Anyways, before we edit in an update, that the, the long-awaited update from Every, the, from we've the been pitching it this whole episode. Oh, you guys are so man. excited, and literally all it's gonna be is me at home going God of War one or something. Yeah. But you're waiting for it. You're gonna find out. Did the Game Awards go Goblin mode or not? <laughs> well, uh, uh, before that, you should absolutely go check out the new trailer for This Place Rules, which is. Not the title I was expecting, but that's Channel 5 with Andrew Callahan's first special for HBO. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about this when it was announced, but it's basically an extended, polished version of their typical Channel 5 interview show, except this one revolves around the lead up to what would eventually become an insurrection on the U.S. Capitol. We will, of course, yeah. leave a link to the trailer in the description below, but uh, here's some more information about the special from Vulture and HBO. Titled This Place Rules, the documentary-style special now has a trailer featuring shots of Callahan playing hype man for what appears to be a MAGA rap performance, a man beating up a mailbox while yelling, no more mail-in ballots, a drunk Alex Jones breaking a bench, Callahan refereeing a very unglamorous boxing match, lots of unhinged protest signs, and more. In 2020, as COVID rages, protests sweep the country, and a monumental election looms, Callahan captures the chaos in the streets and a wide spectrum of views with just a camera and a microphone, reads an HBO press release. Delving into a world of political division, white nationalist groups, and conspiracy theorists, This Place Rules exposes the perfect storm in the months preceding the Capitol attack and serves as a stark warning that these forces show no signs of abating. This Place Rules was directed by Callahan and produced by A24, as well as Tim Heidecker, Eric Wareheim, and Jonah Hill. It will debut on HBO on December 30th, just before the new year. Oh, man. Something fun to watch over the holidays. Yeah, it was, it, they should have put, they should have published this on Christmas Eve, so everyone who's with Could watch it with their family? Watch it with their parents, and obviously all agree on their opinion of the events being depicted. Really brings everyone together. Well, I'm glad we all agree that January 6th was bad. This is perfect, though. I mean, it's it's in line with, like, the Sasha Baron Cohen stuff 
Uh, except it's, I think it might actually be better because no one's being tricked into saying the things that they, yeah. not that they're being tricked into it on the Sasha Baron Cohen thing, but they are like put into situations where those can arise. Whereas Callahan just kind of points a camera and says, this is America. Yeah. Literally. He, uh, he doesn't, he, he lets them do the talking. He's got a very, his style is really Give him enough room. And like, even when he's made people, well, even when he's posted videos that made people look bad it's just them doing it and yeah. so he's been able to like maintain uh relationships with a lot of his subjects even though it's like he's making them look bad but they he, can't, but no they he's still not. like him yeah. he's not making them right. look bad they are and in in that way they can assume that it is the audience that's wrong or something yeah um but yeah no his approach to documenting reality is uh, simple but extremely important and effective and because it shows he's th- yeah he's just a guy yeah like that helps a lot yeah he's not like he's not the mainstream media he's just a dude in a fucking van yeah he's not showing a up in a jacket in a suit with a slick back haircut and if he is it's part of a bit and the yeah. suit is probably oversized yeah he's yeah. uh one of the one of the craziest like vo- I want to say voices in media but he barely even speaks yeah, but, uh, but his work's important. Very important. What, and a great documentarian. And great to see it get uh, d- just like put on HBO because that's the thing is like you don't. It's hard to think about how just how massive HBO is because you can see it with the Nathan Fielder thing. Like I just assume Nathan Field like everyone had seen Nathan for you. No. But then uh, the HBO show comes out and it's like, then it's really what's yeah. big. It, it's it's crazy to see, but. Honestly, it's it's awesome seeing them go from like a ragtag team in a van driving around the country fueled by ad dollars to a debut special on HBO that will almost certainly net them some awards. Like, that's probably going to happen. So congrats to Andrew and the entire team. Cannot wait to watch it. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. I am going to cut it. Not from here. Not from our studio. I'm going to cut in from a completely different location. People say, they say never go to a second location. Well, I'm going to do it. So here it is. The moment you've been waiting for. The highly anticipated announcement of what happened at the Game Awards. Elden Ring won. The JoJo's are good this year. Elden Ring won. Just Elden Ring. Some guy got on the stage at some point, too. Okay, good night. Well, I hope that was worth all the fuss and lead up, but there you go. Yeah. Games! We love games, don't we, folks? And we love playing them. In the meantime, we do have videos for you to watch. We have a a recent episode of Tech News Day. We have a new episode of Weekly Weird News. We're going to be back with more Weekly Weird News coming up. Um, Next week, lots of videos. But after that, mm -mm -mm, we're going on break. No mas. We're just giving you a heads up that... We are not going to be working over the holidays. So yeah. enjoy the content up until like next Friday yeah. or Saturday. And uh, then please enjoy giving us a break. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, all the likes, all the new subscribers, which we, yeah, they're still going up. Thank you so much for that. All the comments and likes. We really appreciate it. We'll be back soon for Weekly Weird News. Check out all our videos. They're up there now. And we'll see you soon. Bye.